Hello everyone, I'm technically not a technician, and in today's DIY guide, we'll be going where no mod has gone before. Today I'll be giving you my full updated guide for the Simpsons Arcade 1UP. This guide will cover updating your theme and show you how to expand your internal storage. Also, we will be referencing past videos to save time. With this video and the past videos we'll be referencing, we should be able to install all of the repackaged APK files, set up all of our supporting apps to help us navigate using only the native controls, add buttons for console games, get our trackball working, and set up RetroArch and Dig. This video is for educational purposes only and is only intended to show you what I've done and what my results are. If you choose to modify your systems using this or any other information I've provided from any video or content I've created, you do so at your own risk. I, this channel, or any person connected to this video will not be held liable for any choices you make with your hardware or software. Modify at your own risk. In order to go where no mod has gone before, we'll have a few hardware prerequisites that we'll need. Obviously, we need a working Simpsons cab with a working PCB board. I'm also going with two forms of storage for my mod, one will be an SD card, and the other will be a USB drive. I do recommend that you use quality drives. I'd recommend a 3 USD card and a 3.0 USB or better. There is a method to my madness. In short, I'll be using the SD card for the ROMs, BIOS files, and system images. However, I'll be installing apps on the USB drive, and I'll use that drive as internal storage. I'll be expanding on this more, as there are a few important details in how I got all of it to work as one. You'll also need a USB 3.0 or better USB hub. I'd recommend one with four USB 3.0 ports and one USB charging port. I've also extended my USB ports to the front of my cab, so I can plug into the cab without removing the back panel. These two items help fight the low battery bug and make it easy to soft mod my cab. Working coin buttons were the next addition I made, they were simpler to do than they appeared to be, however, they do require the mystery Dawson experience to be installed. These are great for giving you that arcade feel when using MAME or Final Burn, and they even open up a great deal of compatibility when it comes to console games, as many require a start and select key. Trackball games are also important to me. In fact, modding this cab so I could play games like Golden Tea was a big part of why I got this cab. Lucky for me, with the 12-in-1 encoder, that mod couldn't have been easier, and now I can also play my favorite trackball games. For a full list of all the parts one used, please check out the links in the description. They are affiliate links. You will be helping this channel grow. You'll know you have the right part, and you'll have my eternal thanks. Unfortunately, my eternal thanks will not help you mod your cab. However, do you know what will help you modify your cab? A software prerequisite list could be helpful, so, I'll do my best to provide what software I can for you, and I'll even list out what software I cannot. As all of you know, things like game ROMs, console and arcade BIOS files, and the arcade 1UP repackaged APK files are all items that I cannot link to, and you'll have to use Google or the Internet Archive to find them. I will be providing you with a few standard Android APK files, a ton of icons, and a dig theme. I've placed the items I can inside a 7-zip file called, the kitchen sink. I was going to call the zip file, where no mod has gone before, but I felt that sounded kind of long. Regardless, as for the files I can provide, please find the helpful link in the description, and I'd also recommend joining us on Facebook and Discord. You'll find links to those groups in the description as well. I do wish to set you up to succeed in this modding endeavor, and with that in mind, let's talk about the software that you must procure on your own. This sounds scary, but using Google combined with the correct keywords, and you should be able to find a few repositories with the items you need. You will need, and I do recommend, getting the BIOS files for the consoles, repackaged APK files, and, of course, console and arcade ROMs. As far as the items that can be found in the helpful links section, you'll find a few APK files like RetroArch, the images we need for Dig, both versions of the Mystery Dawson experience, needed for installing and patching the 4-player fix, the control exclusion list, and the images we need for Nova Launcher. In order to procure said files, please look for the link in the description, and when followed, you should find a good old drive that seems to be filling up a little too quickly. Once on this shared drive, look for the 7-zip file called Kitchen Sync, and start the download. You will need a zip utility to open this file. Any will do, but I like 7-zip because it's free. When you're downloading this file, 
Google will try to scan the contents of the download, however, you'll be informed that the file is too large. This is normal, and if you're daring enough to try, continue the download. Once it is done downloading, place it in a safe place with your repackaged APKs, the BIOS files, and, of course, your game ROMs. Now that we have all of the software downloaded and saved to a safe location, let's move over to the hardware we've added. I've done detailed videos on each of the mods I've done, and the hardware mods are broken into three parts. The first video is one regarding negating the low battery bug, plus this mod helps me be a little lazy by rerouting some USB ports to the front of my cab. This is helpful, as I don't have to take the back off when I go to change my modifications. As I'm sure you can imagine, I make changes to my cab often, and this simple modification has been handy in making those endeavors as lazy as possible. The second hardware mod is adding working buttons to the stock Simpsons PCB control board. This mod does require the Mystery Dawson experience to work, it opens up a great deal of possibilities on console compatibility, and if you know how to use a soldering iron, then this mod is for you. I feel the video of this mod is very easy to follow, and it will show you how I got mine working. The last mod that I did was the 12-in-1 encoder for making the trackball work with RetroArch. Adding the hardware to this was very easy. In fact, this hard mod is basically plug and play. The hardest part of this mod is telling RetroArch to use the trackball. That said, if you follow the video for it, you'll have no issues. I'll be sure to have links to each of these videos in the description, and you may also see links to them at the top right of this video from time to time as well. That should cover all of our hard mods, and we can now start to move on to the software we'll be using, how we'll be installing it, and how we'll be setting the software up. I've got to admit, this took me some time to figure out, but once I did, I was able to get the right combo of apps, installed in the right places, and set up in the right way, so that everything works together as one. This combination of apps, on this hardware, is the best I've been able to come up with, however, I do still occasionally get the double boot video when my system first starts up. But as for bugs or stability issues, that is the worst that I've had. I believe that gets all of the prerequisites and important information out of the way, so let's get our files ready and set up our SD card. For this section of the video, I'm going to assume that you've downloaded the kitchen sink, and you've also downloaded any or all of the repackaged arcade 1UP APK files, any ROM files for consoles you wish, and of course any console BIOS you wish to use with RetroArch. To get everything ready to transfer to my micro SD card, I'll first extract the 7-zip file called the kitchen sink to the same locations as my ROMs, repackaged APK files, and my BIOS files. The kitchen sink, like the name implies, is a large zip file, and it's important to note that not everything in the kitchen sink needs to go on our SD card. It's also important to note that the newer the computer and the better the hardware you use, the smoother these processes will be. After you've extracted everything from the kitchen sink, locate and move to a safe location the folder titled MDE Installer plus Patch and Exclusion List. We're going to need the contents of that folder later in the video. However, before then, I do wish to again thank and send a shout out to Team Encoder for the Mystery Dawson experience, without your efforts, our mods would be way less fun. With that in mind, if you'd like to support Team Encoder, I will have a link to their website and Patreon in the description. Now that I have everything extracted and I've moved the Mystery Dawson experience to a safe location, I'd like to clean our APK folders up a little, as these folders in this structure will be copied over to the SD card, and this folder structure is kind of the base that I'll be working off of. Consolidating the APKs will also help later, as after they are installed and working, we'll not need them again. Two important notes, one regarding the repackaged APK files, and the other for your ROMs. Keep note of each of the names in the brackets, as you'll need those later for the exclusion list, and we'll speak more about that list later. The other is with your ROMs, and the format of the sets you use. Both DIG and RetroArch seem to favor the compression of .zip formats over that of the .7-zip. This is probably not a big deal, and I'm sure I'm overthinking it once again. However, I did try both, and ROM scanning of zip files is much faster. Regardless, the compression tool made by 7-zip can process both formats, and regardless of the app you use, I'd recommend using the .zip format. Also, if you plan on playing disc-based games, then please make sure you try the .chud format. The compression rate is great, and the playback is outstanding. The last item as far as ROM sets is to use no intro naming conventions, and if you use a no intro set, be sure to pare it down, as the newer sets are really loaded. 
Now that we've got all of our software ready to be moved to the SD card, let's make our SD card ready for our software. Basically, we need to remove the back of our cab and locate the PCB board. Once we've located the PCB board, we need to find the location of the SD card port and insert our SD card into the port. After the SD card is inserted into the port, we can move to the front of the cab, and with our wireless USB keyboard mouse combo inserted in, we'll press the Windows key and the N key at the same time. Doing this action will give us access to the Android OS, and if we expand that OS menu, we'll find a settings icon. If we then activate the settings icon, we'll gain access to the main settings menu. Here we'll find the settings option, and when selected, we'll have access to the available storage. If selected, we can access the SD card, and for this mod, I'll be formatting the SD card as portable storage. After selecting portable storage, click on the format SD card, and the process will begin. It does take about 25 seconds, and when doing so, mine looks as if it gets stuck at 20%. However, give the process time, and you'll be successful. Once the process is finished, you'll be given a prompt that says the card is done and ready to use. Simply click on the done button in the bottom right corner, and you'll be kicked back into the main Simpsons APK running in the background. After this, simply re-enter the Android OS, again find your storage area, and safely eject your SD card so we can move all of the software we'll need from our PC to our SD card. With the SD card inserted into your PC, locate the root of your SD card. Mine is showing up as the letter E and looks as if it's a USB drive. This is because of the USB adapter I'm using. Regardless, find the root of your SD card and copy over all of the software files that we've collected and that we'll need. Please keep in mind that the Mystery Dawson experience, also known as the 4-player fix, does not need to be copied to the SD card. Keep the MDE folder and the files in it in a safe place on your PC. In fact, as we wait for these files to copy over to our SD card, let's get the Mystery Dawson experience installed and set up. Before we all get crazy, please remember that there is a full video just for this step, you will need to watch that video for all of the steps needed. This is because of time, and we'll just be doing an overview in this video. With that out of the way, locate the safe place where you've moved the Mystery Dawson experience to, and once found, copy both of the subfolders. The first subfolder should be titled MDE Simpsons 1.0, and the second will be titled MDE Simpsons 2.0.7. Both were exceptional and very exciting titles, indeed. With that said, paste both folders into the root of your C drive. I'm not 100% sure this is needed, but I believe I remember the original instructions informing us to do so, and I'm 100% sure it will not hurt. So we'll be doing so. Quick note, for recording purposes, I did need to change the computer I was using. That said, we're using the same files, and again, those files are pasted to the root of the C drive. I hope the change in OS didn't create any confusion. However, I can tell you that installing, patching, and pushing the config exclusion list did work on Windows 10 and 11, on both older and newer hardware. As stated previously in the video, we'll not be completely covering this step, as I've made a great video showing you the full process step by step. However, I will be pointing out a few important notes I think we all should keep in mind. The first key note, and I must admit I don't have this cab to test it myself, but many modders in the community have informed me that this will work with the newer version of the Turtles cab. So if you have that purple beast, you should be able to do everything in this mod other than the trackball stuff. The second item of importance, as of making this video, is the order in which you use them. I've not been able to get version 2.0.7 to install on a freshly formatted cab. What I have had success with is installing version 1.0 and then using the newer version to patch the older version. It's somewhat annoying, and I'm uncertain whether I'm simply not utilizing version 2.0.7 correctly or not. What I do know is that I don't seem to be the only modder in our community having this issue, and other modders have also gotten it to work with this method. I believe the last thing that I wish to make clear is that you will need to push the config exclusion list to the PCB board after you've installed the Mystery Dawson experience. You'll also want to verify that you've hit enter at the last line of the list, or it will not work. I've also noted that sometimes I've had to push the list twice, but that could have been due to user error. We'll now need to connect to our Wi-Fi. I've found that this can be tricky. However, using the keyboard and mouse and connecting to the Wi-Fi directly from the PCB's operating system will solve most of the issues. 
If you continue to have issues, use your phone as a hotspot. I've no idea why this happens to some of us, and I've no idea why the hotspot trick works. I just know it does. After connecting to the internet, the system will prompt you to update your cab. You should, as the stock APK kind of sucked, and it really did need to be updated. After the update, however, I've not had issues. Each game in the APK ran fine and worked great. After updating the stock software, you may wish to start each game and verify that it is working as designed. Please remember that when booting each ROM for the first time, the game will start slowly. The next time you start one of the stock games, it should be faster. With the Mystery Dawson experience done, let's move over to the cab and set up our USB drive. Remember when I said there would be some method to my madness? Well, let's chat about that. As you know, I've already formatted my SD card as portable storage, and if you recall, that SD card is currently having all of my needed files copied over to it on my other PC as we've been working and setting this cab up. This USB drive I'll be using will be formatted for use by the tablet, and I'll not be removing it. The most important thing to remember is that when we're done formatting the drive, we'll be asked if we'd like to move files to the USB drive. Tell the system later, as we do not want that option, and if we do select that option, needed files that must stay on the PCB storage will get moved to the USB drive, and this action will in fact break the Mystery Dawson 4 player fix. So please don't do that. With the 4 player fix installed and the USB drive formatted for use by the tablet, but without moving files over, let's check our SD card. As you can see, our files are done moving over, and I can now move my SD card from my PC and insert the card back into my Simpsons cab. We now have all of our storage set up, and I wish to again press the Windows key and the N key to gain access to the Android menu. Here, we'll once again click on the settings icon and access the Android systems menu. Then let's navigate to the storage, and let's talk about how and where we'll be setting things up. There are a few concepts that I'd like to speak on here. First, and I think we all understand this first item, we're modifying an arcade cab to do a ton of things it was not really made to do. Second, the hardware that comes on the stock PCB is very limited, and in order to do some of the things we wish to do, we must expand on it. However, we also need to understand how the unit will work once we've added to it. With that said, what I've learned is that any app that governs or manages any other app will need to be installed on the PCB's built-in internal storage. The apps that govern our mod will be Button Mapper and Nova Launcher. I believe this is necessary given that Androids need to pull information from those programs when the system is first booting up and coming online. What I believe I've been able to ascertain is that if you don't install those apps and keep them on the PCB's internal storage, you'll not have Button Mapper running when needed, and you'll have to manually start that service, and Nova will stop being the default home screen, forcing you to select that option at each boot, regardless of what selection you make. The next item I've been able to ascertain is that the USB drive formatted to be used by the tablet seems to run a little faster than the SD card when formatted in the same way. This seems to help my system not have a double boot video. However, now and again, about once every fourth start, I still get the double boot video. Because this option seems to be a little faster, I'll be installing all of the repackaged APKs on this drive. I'll also be installing Dig and RetroArch on this drive as well. Both of those apps could be used in place of a home screen. However, when installed on the PCB's onboard storage and when I use large ROM sets, I've seen both application scrapers have issues with managing the game snaps after the internal storage gets too full. However, when installing on the USB drive, I've not had those issues. The last items on the list are the ROMs, BIOS files, and the theme and icons I've made. Those items can all be placed on the SD card. I also wish to point out that I believe I've had issues getting the PCB to write to the SD card reliably. What I've noted is that when I tell Dig or RetroArch to write to the portable storage, those apps get all buggy. However, it seems that they can read from that location without trouble. Please let me know in the comments if you've had the same or similar issues. I'd also like to take a second and kind of explain my thinking. I understand that the stock Simpsons PCB isn't rated to take advantage of the speeds of a 3 USD card, nor can it take full advantage of a 3.0 USB drive or higher. So what is my thinking here? Why would I waste my hard-earned dollar on something my PCB can't take full advantage of? Simple, I wanted to make sure that the only bottleneck I was dealing with would be from the PCB itself. 
It's the one item on the unit that can't really be upgraded unless you replace it outright with something new. It is now time to start installing apps. For the repackaged APK files, I'm going to give you a very short version of how to install them. For two reasons, first, to save time, and second, community member and famed YouTuber Alex V has already made a very detailed video showing you the process, and I'm kind of lazy and will not be duplicating that video, so go watch his. I'll make sure to provide you with a link to his video. I do wish to add that if you do not watch his full video for all the details, you will have issues getting all of the games to work. The really fast version is to install each app based on size, installing the largest to the smallest until each app is done. I'll also not be starting any of the repackaged apps until each is installed, and until after I've installed and set up our two managing apps, Nova and Button Mapper. I'll also say that I'm installing the old Sunset Riders for nostalgia. I know those games have been loaded onto another APK, but I've got a soft spot for that APK, and I really like the art. We'll also need to install four more apps to help everything run smoothly. RetroArch, Dig, Button Mapper, and Nova Launcher are all easy to install, just like the repackaged APK files. The only difference between the repackaged APK files and these APK files is that you'll have a prompt pop-up that you'll have to enable on a few of them. Other than that, they will all install fine, and you will install them very similarly to the repacked APKs. Also to note, Button Mapper and Nova are both for managing and navigating our cabs. Both will need to be accessed by the system as soon as it boots, and if these are not installed on the onboard PCB storage, your system will not see them at boot, and your cab will act buggy. After installing all of our apps, we'll need to set up our managing apps, and we'll start by backing out of storage and moving to the program section of our Android menu. We'll then enter the app section, and we'll find an open button mapper. After we open Button Mapper, we'll get a prompt asking us to enable some services, and when we confirm that option, we'll get kicked out, and be required to reopen Button Mapper, only to be prompted once again to enable more needed services. After enabling and allowing the needed services, we'll need to set up our live key to let us exit from the repackaged APK files and the stock Simpsons APK file. To make this happen, we'll first need to click on the yellow plus in the lower left side of the screen, and when done, a new menu will pop up. This menu will give us two options, and we'll wish to pick the top option labeled, short and long press. After making that selection, we'll be presented with a new menu, and from the top drop-down menu, select other, and when prompted, press the live key. On the next drop-down menu, we'll need to select how long we wish to press the key to activate the function. I've played with this, and I like the feel of 3 seconds, but feel free to play with these options. In the next drop-down, we're simply going to change it to home, as returning to the home screen is the action we'd like to run when we activate the live key long press. In our last drop-down menu, we'll see what apps this newly programmed function will be active in. In this section, we'll need to select the custom list option. Once we select that option, a new menu will open, and before we do anything, make sure to look for and select the option that says active only in these apps. After you've selected that option, name this list. I'll be calling mine, APK list, but feel free to get crazy with this naming convention. We now need to select all the apps we wish this function to be active in. Basically, we need to select all the repackaged APK files and the stock Simpsons APK file. I'll personally not be selecting the Dig and RetroArch apps, as these have built-in exit functionality and work great with the stock controls and the team in Coder's Mystery Dawson experience. Also, not selecting RetroArch helps you set up the live key as a hotkey. This can be helpful if you need the hotkey to change out a disc-based game or even change the sides of a disc when using the Famicom disc system. I also almost forgot one important detail. Make sure you've not missed any of the repackaged APK files, as you're unable to edit this custom list we've made. If you do miss one, do not worry. You can always delete this function and simply start again. However, as far as I can tell, you're unable to make changes to the list once they are made. Once we're done, back out of Button Mapper and back into the Android system that governs the Button Mapper app. Here we have an option to make changes to where Button Mapper is installed. If we look right now, we should be told that it is installed on the USB drive. If you recall, Button Mapper helps manage the system, and if we wish for the Button Mapper services to start at boot, we'll need to move the installation location to the PCB's internal storage. This way, the PCB sees Button Mapper at boot and is able to start the services associated with the app. 
If we do not do this step, we'll have to manually start button mapper after the cab boots before we can use it to exit games back to Nova and our home screen. After setting up button mapper and changing the location of where it's installed, we'll get kicked back out into the stock Simpsons APK, and we'll need to get back into our system. Again, we'll press the Windows and N keys at the same time, and we'll be given our Android system menu once again. We'll need to expand the menu and click on the setting icon so we can have access to the system settings. Here we'll need to find the app section again, and once in the section, we'll need to locate and launch Nova for the first time. When doing so, we'll be asked to enable some needed services, and we'll then be given access to a basic options screen. In this basics options screen, we'll wish to do as we've done before and make it look as much like a kiosk as we can, deselecting as many options as we have available and selecting none under dock. The only thing I'm going to do differently here is make my icons as large as possible. When done, simply pull the options screen all the way up and look for a red check mark at the bottom right side. When you click on it, you'll be kicked back into the arcade 1UP Simpson stock APK that is running in the background. We'll use those two magic keys to get us back into the Android menu. We'll expand our menu, and then click on the setting icon, giving us access to the setting menu. Here we'll look for the apps option, and we'll now change the default home screen to Nova Launcher, and when done, we'll be kicked into our new default home screen. We need to move Nova to the PCB's internal storage, just as we did with the button mapper app. We also need to do this for the same reasons. Nova is going to be the default home screen, and if the PCB doesn't see Nova at boot up, it's not going to load the app, and you'll get the home screen pop up each time the system boots. See, as I told you, there is some method to my madness. With that done, we again enter the Android basic menu and expand it. Then we find our setting icon in the bottom right corner, and we click on the icon to access the main Android settings menu. We then navigate to the apps section and look for and open the Nova Launcher app. Now that we're on our new home screen, let's set it up so we can access all of our apps. Next, we'll need to remove the two icons left behind, and when done, we'll need to click on any open space and enter the Nova menu, then look for and click on the Nova settings icon to enter the settings menu. After entering the settings menu, navigate to the top of the screen to find the home screen setting, and enter that menu. Once in that menu, you'll be confronted with options for a screen and icon layout. In this section, we'll need to change the layout to 2 on the vertical axis, and we'll need to change the horizontal setting to 5. This will give us the correct layout for the wallpaper that I'll be using. If you're using a different one or your mod has differed from this one, you may need to use a different set of settings. I've also turned off subgrid positioning in this section. Next, I turn off the corner radius on the widgets and disable the dock. Back out all the way to the main Nova screen, and click and hold on any open space to access the Nova settings. In this menu, we'll have access to the wallpaper settings option, and here we'll want to select the pick an image option from the bottom left corner. After we've selected the pick an image option, we'll want to navigate to, find, and select the SD card. From here, we'll wish to navigate to the Nova folder and open it to find two more folders, one for the icons I've made and one for the wallpapers. Please open the wallpaper folder and select a wallpaper to use. After selecting the wallpaper, click on the check mark in the top left corner, and you'll be asked how you'd like to set your wallpaper. I'm just going to set it for everything. It just seems easy that way. Next, we need to add some icons, and I'm going to start with the Droid Cade installer. I'm not going to review setting this up again. As Alex V has done a great job explaining it, I'm kind of lazy, and you should go watch his video. What I will say is that I did add this app to the magic button mapper list, and when I do use the installer, I'll back out with button mapper, and then simply remove the icon from the home screen and uninstall the app. I'm also going to add the app first, as the first app always seems to default to the far window. This way, it will be out of the way as I set up the other icons, but still ready for me to run it when the time comes. Again, when ready, click your mouse on the screen, and Nova will open, and now we'll wish to set our icons. We'll start with the Simpsons APK, and to set up this icon, we'll expand the Nova menu, grab the action icon, and drop it over the area we wish to place our Simpsons icon. Once the icon is in place, a new menu opens and asks what APK corresponds to this icon, and here we'll want to select the A1UP app. When done, a small drop-down menu opens with only one option, which says Main Activity. Select that option, and we'll get kicked back into the main home screen with a really crappy-looking icon. 
Here, we can press and hold the icon to open a new menu, where we'll select the edit option. Once open, we'll delete the APK title, and if you press and hold the icon image, we'll get another menu, and here we'll need to select the gallery apps option. Once done, you'll get two options. Please select the files option, then back out to the Nova folder and select the icons option. In this folder, navigate down to the Simpsons icon and make that selection. After doing so, the system will ask if you wish to crop the image. If you don't need to make adjustments, simply click done. And when kicked out, unclick the resize image option and click done. We've just set up our first APK icon. For the next few icons, we'll be doing the same as the first. Clicking and holding on any open section of the home screen, then expanding the presented menu, we'll then drag the action icon in place, associate the action with our next app, delete the APK title, and pick and adjust our icon image. Most of these will be the same, however, now and again, things don't go as expected. Like this image, for instance, I've no idea why a few of these have done this. I'm thinking I got the aspect ratio off, but in truth, I'm unsure why we've got to expand some of these. It's not really a big deal, as after they are cropped correctly, they look fine. At this point, I'm just going to move straight from right to left. Each of the repackaged APK files will basically be done the same way. As you can see, the community has learned, and as people in the community have improved, the APKs have as well. The first APK, Droid K00, did not have an icon image at all and kind of looked bland. I get that icon images are kind of a small thing, but they do make it easier to identify the new APK apps. Next we'll do the icon for Dig, which, as far as setting up the action, is the same as the repackaged APK files, however, it does give us a few options to pick from when selecting the corresponding listed options. I've been picking the option listed as main, and I'd recommend you do the same. Retroarch is the same as Dig and has multiple options to select from, and just like Dig, you'll need to pick the option listed as main in the title. That's really the only difference, and after that, you simply select the image you wish to use as an icon. After setting up Dig, I'll move on to the other APK files, again going from right to left, placing the action icon in the area that I wish to execute the APK from, and of course selecting the image that I wish the APK to be associated with. I did make each of the icons on this mod, and please feel free to add to them. A handful of them have a few options that you can choose from. Those that do have options have those options because of other projects I have or have had in the works, and I figured, why not let people use them if they wish. I mean, I have them on hand. I believe most of the icons are 400 pixels by 400 pixels, and that size is overkill for the size monitor we have on the Simpsons cab, but in my defense, I'm not professionally trained in image manipulation, and I wanted the icons to look nice. We now have a nice looking wallpaper and all of our icons in place, and this is starting to look like a great multi cave However, we're not done. Before we start and test out the home screen, the repackaged APK, and button mapper for exiting, we'll also need to run the installer. This is again covered in Alex V's video, so I'll not be covering it, but I do wish to say that after you're done running it, and if you've set everything up as I have, you should be able to exit with your live key, and when you're done with the installer, you can remove the icon from our home screen and uninstall the app to help us save space. At this point in the mod, I do want to check and verify that each repackaged APK is working. When you first start each APK, you will get a one-time menu that will pop up asking for you to enable some permissions, and it's also nice to get those messages out of the way. Of course, this is also the first time we get to verify that the live key will exit each repackaged APK, so now is a great time to verify that as well. Please remember that if you do miss one of the repackaged APK files, you'll not be able to edit its list. However, you can build a new list, and I believe you can make changes to the other functions like how many seconds you hold the live key to exit, or what action will happen when using the live key, or even edit the function to use a different key other than the live key. Regardless, this is a great time to verify everything is working as designed and to make any needed corrections to button mapper if need be. Let's go ahead and launch Retroarch and set it up to meet our needs. If you use the version of Retroarch that is included in the download of the Mystery Dawson experience, it should be configured correctly right out of the box for anyone who has not added buttons to the cab. I do wish to point out that because of the way Retroarch handles controls, you'll wish to use player 1 or red controls for anything that will require a select and a start key. As I'm sure you know, arcade cabs will work fine when using the same button for a coin and start button. However, consoles are not as forgiving, 
and if you do wish to play any console game that will require both a start and select key, then you will need to use the Red Player 1 controls. For this mod, I will be showing you how I've configured mine for the button options I've added. Using the red controls first, as RetroArch sees the first controller used as player 1, and also because the red controls are linked to the live key. We'll make our way to the settings section and find and enter the menu option. From the menu option, pick the XMB option, as this menu style and layout are easier to navigate and use. When done, back all the way out and re-enter the main menu section. From the main menu section, select configuration file, and save this new configuration. When done, back out to the main menu again and exit RetroArch. After RetroArch has been relaunched, we will have a pleasing and uncluttered appearance to work from. Next, in order for RetroArch to know which controller is which, I'll be activating each player's control, one at a time and in order. This action sends a signal from each of the player controls in the correct order to RetroArch so that RetroArch will know which controller corresponds to which player. It's important to understand that this needs to be done in order, starting with player 1 and working our way to player 4. We'll next wish to tell RetroArch where we've placed the BIOS files. To do this, we'll move to the settings section, and at the bottom of that section, we'll need to find and select the directories section. Once in the directories section, we'll need to navigate to and select our BIOS folder on our SD card. Adding BIOS files is optional, and most consoles will work without them. However, you can get better emulation by adding them, so I'll be doing so. Next, I'll wish to change the on-screen display settings from this same menu section. In short, we'll navigate up a little to the area that is cleverly labeled as on-screen display, and we enter that option. Here we enter the on-screen overlay section, and we disable this option. Doing so will remove the console overlays that are set as defaults. We'll now back out, and we'll enter the controller input section. I do want to point out that setting up yours may differ if you've not added buttons or if you've added buttons in some other way. Because I've added working coin buttons to this cab, and because those buttons will do double duty as select buttons on consoles, I'll be setting this cab to exit back into the menu if you press the start and coin buttons at the same time. If you've not modded your cab as I have, you'll have to come up with another way to exit. I'd suggest using the hotkey and the start button. Next, I'll be programming the live key as the hotkey. This will be helpful if you wish to add quick saves, to help you change discs on two disc games, to flip a disc when playing Famicom Disk System, or again to exit to the main RetroArch menu if you don't have separate start and select keys. The next thing I wished to do was give access to the menu to anyone on any of the controllers. In theory, I believe this should give access to the RetroArch menu from any of the controllers, regardless of what player controls are used. I now need to program in the new coin door buttons, and I'll also need to tell RetroArch that the start button will no longer act as both the coin and start buttons. In short, we'll need to enter each of the player's controls, navigate down to the select button, remap it to the new coin button I've added, and then move down one more space to the start key and remap it also. This will need to be done with each of the player's controls, and when done, each player should have separate start and select buttons programmed in. We'll also wish to build what RetroArch calls a playlist. Basically, it's a list of ROMs that you have. To do this, we'll move out of the settings section, and we'll move to the section marked with a little plus. Once in this area, select Scan Directory, and you'll be asked to select where you've placed your ROMs. In this area, we need to navigate to our ROMs directory and start a scan. I do recommend that you set this up to scan overnight if you have large sets or multiple sets of ROMs, as this can take time. I also want to add that you'll need to add emulator cores to your RetroArch setup for each of your ROM sets, and you'll wish to assign each emulator core to each ROM set. I'm not going to go over this, as this guide isn't really about setting up RetroArch, and let's face it, this guide is starting to get really long. If you do need help setting up RetroArch, there are tons of videos regarding the subject. Let's now move on to the last thing we need to set up, and that would be the front end. We'll be using Dig, and we'll be setting up a Homer Simpsons theme. When you first open Dig, it will take a second to set itself up. Simply wait, and when it is done, you'll be asked if you wish to scan for games. At this time, you'll wish to select later. Next, navigate down to the Options selection, and when open, find the area labeled as Theme, and make that selection. We'll now move down and open the Edit Theme option, and after it is open, Navigate to the bottom area where it says background, open it, and set the transparency. I'm not sure it matters much what we set it to. 
However, before we can set the background, this step must be done. Now, we'll wish to navigate back to the top, find and select the area that is labeled as background image or video, and look for and find the area called folder. After making the folder selection, you'll be asked to navigate to the correct folder that houses the images we are using. You can find those images on our SD card, in a folder called Dig and Icons. The folder we're looking for will be marked as Background Homer, and when you find that option, select it, and then click Confirm at the bottom right side. Next, we'll need to do the identical step with the foreground, the only difference is that we'll not be picking a folder but an image file inside of the folder. After you've selected the image file, click on the Confirm button on the bottom right side. The background sounds are optional and done the same as the background images. Again, you'll wish to look for it on the SD card, and you'll be selecting the folder called Background Sounds. After making the selection, be sure to click on the Confirm option on the lower right side. Once done, click on the Save option, and then OK, and you'll be shown the basic new theme. Next, we'll scan our ROMs so that they run in the background. This will let us work on other things as the system builds our game lists. To do this, we'll need to go into our options and select the ROM scanning option from the top of the menu. Then select Start a manual scan, and you'll be asked where. For this mod, I selected Scan a folder, and when doing so, you'll be asked to locate the folder. At this time, you'll wish to tell Dig where the ROM's folder is, and when done, simply click Confirm. Dig will now scan the contents of that folder, and Dig will start to build your game lists. We'll now back out to the main menu, and we'll need to set up our menu icons, which is done in two steps. The first step is to assign an image to each of these menu selections. I'll be working from top to bottom, and each menu selection is done the same. First, we'll wish to click and hold the menu selection, and then a submenu will come up that says Change Icon. Click the Change Icon, and when asked, navigate to the SD card and find the Icons folder. Inside the Icons folder, you'll find a folder called Main, and inside the Main folder, you'll find the icon images that correspond to each of the main menu options. Select the image that corresponds to the menu icon. It's important to note that the images will not change until we change the format of the menu, and that happens to be our second step. The second step is also much easier, as all we are doing is telling the system to display the new images in the wheel format. For this action, we'll wish to locate the three dots at the top right of the corner and click on them. When doing so, we'll get a submenu, and we'll select the viewers option. This action will give us a larger submenu, and from this submenu, we'll select the wheel option. After doing so, we should now have a nice wheel menu with all of our new images visible. At this time, some of our game lists should be populated. I do wish to point out that Dig seems to get stuck when scanning for ROMs now and again, and I'd need to reboot Dig to continue with my ROM scanning. Also, if you wish to split sets, for example, splitting the NES and Famicom, or Mega Drive and Genesis, then I would recommend only scanning the NES and Mega Drive first, then adding the others as clones. Dig seems to have a hard time dividing those up. I'm not going to get into the cloning of systems at this time, as we've done that in a past guide, and this guide is really to update you on the changes. With that said, changing the images for each of our systems is done in the same way as the menu. We click on the old image icon, and we'll get a submenu with a change icon option, and when we select that option, we'll be asked to locate and find the new image. Our new console images can be found in the same area as the main menu icons. However, the folder they are located in is called consoles. Once located, select the image that corresponds to the icon you are working on. Once you've added all your images, you'll also wish to change the menu format to wheel, and this will be done the same as it was done for the main menu, from the three dots at the top right corner, and selecting wheel from the viewers option. You'll also want to manage each of your systems. I wish to mention managing each system, but again, I don't wish to get into how to manage them, as I've already got a video covering that subject. I do wish to say that you will need to make sure you have the right version of RetroArch selected, and you'll need to make sure the core you have selected is installed on RetroArch. If not, your system will crash when Dig tries to hand off to RetroArch. I do wish to speak about how we'll be setting up each wheel, on each game list. The bad news is that we have to do this per game list. The good news is that you already know how to tell Dig to format the game list as a wheel. Because we do it the same as we did the main menu and the console menu. In addition to changing the menu format to wheel, we'll also need to make two more changes. The first will be the aspect ratio of the game icons. This can also be found in the viewers option, 
but this time under this option we'll need to select configure, then icon aspect ratio, and from that list we'll wish to change the aspect ratio to 16 by 9. This should give us a wide screen style icon. After changing the aspect ratio, we'll also need to resize the icon to fit in the little Mario tube. This can be done from the viewers menu, and then the configuration option. From the configuration option, you'll see resize at the bottom. Make that selection, and make the icon smaller until it looks as if it will fit. Once done, each icon should come up from behind the Simpsons cab, and disappear inside the Mario tube. With our theme now in place, we now have a great multi-cab that has the ability to play a ton of classic retro games from our childhoods. When the arcade 1UP Simpsons cab is modified in this way, the system should boot into Nova, and you should be able to use the controls to start and exit any game, as well as access the menus in RetroArch and Dig so that you're able to enter and exit those apps as well. The upside to this mod is that it is very cost effective, it's easy to do, and it gives you the ability to add games from your childhood. As far as downsides, I'd have to remind everyone that we're modifying an arcade cab to do things it was not made to do. With that in mind, I do get that double boot video now and again. Additionally, since I don't use the PCB board to power anything and the majority of my external devices use an externally powered USB hub, external lights for buttons or my trackball won't turn off when I turn the PCB board off. This doesn't bug me personally, as light up buttons aren't my thing. However, I could understand how others may feel differently. I do believe that if someone wishes to do the same mod but also add lights, this would be possible if you used the marquee power supply. You'd simply need to add a splitter, but I'm sure the current for that port would be limited. If you've made it this far in the video, I'd like to thank you, as this was a long one. I do hope that you enjoyed the video and found it informative. If you did, or even if you didn't, please consider subscribing to the channel, sharing this video with a friend on social media, leaving this video a like, turning on the notifications, and leaving a comment. I try to answer all my comments, and I'd love to connect with you. All of these are small clicks of the mouse for you, but to this small channel, those small clicks mean the world. Thank you. Also, a very special thank you to those of you who have supported the channel on Buy Me A Coffee. Those acts of kindness mean the world to me, and they go a long way toward helping grow and support this small channel. Again, thank you for your support.